Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Across the Ocean, the YouTube show for lovers of underwater image making. My name's James in Miami. And this is Matthias, straight from Zurich. <laughs> My idea for this video uh, is that I challenged Matthias to pick his three favorite shots and the only requirement was that he had to have a story to tell about these shots and they had to be shot in 2023. So had to be sort of the, the highlight reel, the best shots of 2023, but not necessarily the technically best artistic shots or, you know, from a camera skills workshop point of view, but something that came with either a lesson or a story or was just an annual highlight. Um, so I thought that would be a fun challenge. Uh, Matthias, I know you've picked out three shots for us. Um, I haven't seen Matthias's shots. He hasn't seen my three shots that I picked for the same challenge. So we figured we'd do a little screen share here. I've got I've got Matthias on Zoom over to my left here, and I'd watch his yeah. videos in uh, in real time and uh, just hear the stories of them and a little bit of reactionary uh, commentary. And uh, as as Matthias talks him through, you know, one, two, and three, and then I would talk through three shots that I really enjoyed uh, from my time underwater in 2023. So I'm going to kick it over to you to introduce. Uh, your three shots, sir, and uh, I look forward to this. I'm excited. So, the first shot that I want to show you um, is a shot that you probably you're probably familiar with. It's a shot that I took on our um, on our group trip to the Philippines in November last year, and uh, you know that I have been very excited about recording a flamboyant cuttlefish on that trip. It was like the one thing like on top of my wish list for that trip and it took me quite a while to actually get to record one of these very cool creatures underwater. You actually recorded one way before I did on that trip which kind of got a little bit to me at that stage but it was all okay because in the end I found one too, uh, actually several ones and uh, I was able to get some, some satisfying footage. Now, the thing that I want to tell you with this shot is um, is basically that it is really exciting, even for me, I, who has been doing a, a lot of diving uh, in his uh, diving career, and I've been filming a lot underwater, but it's still exciting for me to go and look for something that I haven't seen before, I haven't been able to record properly before. And when I get it, I get really, really excited. It's something that really makes me very, very happy to get a shot of the animal, of the behavior of the animal that I've really wanted to capture. And this one actually, I wasn't really, I wasn't really counting on capturing that behavior, but it was really weird. I'll show you the shot now. Um, as it plays back, you can see that it's the um, flamboyant cuttlefish is kind of approaching me and then suddenly it goes into some sort of a freeze, changes color, and it seems like it's hiding and doing like a, you can't see me. And that was really interesting to see. And it did it twice before it then started going off and doing something else. And I have had never seen anything like this before, whether like, described in a book or or like on video or anything like that so this was like a really really special moment for me to see this reaction on a on a flamboyant cuttlefish and it was actually really hard for me to keep the camera steady because I was just so excited about what it was doing so in uh, in uh, short even after having done so many dives and having captured so much stuff underwater I still get very excited about stuff that I see and I get to capture that I haven't captured before underwater. So that's kind of like my first one. And it's also a very sentimental shot because it was taken on our very first um, group trip that we did together. So that also means quite a bit to me. And uh, that's why it made the selection of one of the top three shots of 2023 for me. Yeah, it's spectacular. Um, so yeah, it, it was a great place to go to see flamboyance. Like you said, it, it you know, we, we waited a couple of days, then I got one, then you got one right away afterwards, and then we were seeing them all the time. We were like, ah, oh, they're not as rare as I was led to believe, but at the same time when you see one, you're still like, oh my God, because 
they they are such a spectacularly weird critter uh, with their with their um, displays and the way they pump blood around to create sort of this different camouflage and patterns. Uh, and then and then what you got to witness there is just absolutely extraordinary that it just did this complete defensive camouflage display of you can't see me I'm hiding I'm now now I'm sand colored enjoy I just disappeared <laughs> right in front of your face magic um, and I see you got the hunting yeah. shot there as well where it's it hunts like a chameleon it, it shoots out kind of a I don't think tongue is the right word but kind of a proboscis maybe and uh, yeah. and draws yeah. in all the little critters that it feeds on um, and that's something special to uh, to capture as well so that's awesome man that's really really cool yeah, what a absolutely. great shot yeah I was very happy with that yeah very very happy so let's move on to the second shot now the second shot is a shot of a uh, of a frogfish this was shot in the Maldives on our um, underwater videography workshop that we did in uh, end of November early December in the Maldives and the story behind this shot is that um, normally you don't really take a macro setup to the Maldives. The Maldives really is a wide angle destination because that's where you see, you know, all your shark life, where you see like the rays, where you see the turtles, the nice soft coral formations and all that sort of stuff. So it's not really, but there's plenty of macro stuff there, but you don't really focus on macro filming uh, or taking macro shots in the Maldives. But for, I don't know why, for some reason I decided to make the effort of bringing my macro setup for my red Komodo with me on that trip, even though I was very heavy on my luggage already, but I figured, well, if I'm paying extra for my luggage already anyways, I might as well just bring, you know, a couple extra kilos for my flat port and the 100 millimeter uh, macro lens and everything else that I needed for that setup. Um, and I've only used it on one single dive, and that's the dive where this shot was taken. And I asked the guides repeatedly during the trip, when is a good dive to go and look for macro stuff? And mostly their answer was, not on this dive. Not on this dive. And I kept asking, I was like, man, I really, I brought my macro setup. I wanna have at least one macro dive. When is a good time to do that? And then eventually they said, well, this is a dive site where we know there is a frogfish, so we might be able to show you that one if it's still in the same plan. Well, great, give me half an hour, I'll set up my macro setup on the Komodo and uh, we go frogfish hunting. And that's what we did. And we found this frogfish and things just lined up perfectly as it was sitting in a perfect location. It was looking straight out into, into the blue and I was able to get him head up or um, like from the front as he was yawning so I'll show you the shot here it's not technically not the best shot because I was very excited again and I was shaking a little bit but I am very happy with this shot because it is face on you can see it yawning it's sharp it's a little shaky but it's nice and sharp and it's really opening up that mouth perfectly for me um, and had I not taken my macro setup with me on that on that trip I would have never been able to get that shot and that's kind of the lesson behind that shot for me it's like go that extra mile do that extra effort and bring stuff with you that you think you might not necessarily need but there is a slim chance that you will have an opportunity to use it and it's always better to have stuff with you and not use it than not having it with you and needing it on a trip. So that's kind of the story behind this shot and why this made the selection of the top three shots. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, to find a frogfish is always a challenge. You can see that his right foot or flipper, I don't know how you would yeah. say, fin, uh, they walk, so I'm gonna call it a foot, yeah. uh, is touching a red sponge or red sp spongiformer. And the, the camouflage there is absolutely immaculate. Um, I like the lighting, I like the shadow on one side of his face as well, because that gives a lot of distinction. Um, and, and they're just always a pleasure to see, because they're, again, just weird oddity of a critter, like the uh, flamboyant cuttlefish. It's just like, how and absolutely. why does this exist? What a weird little creature. And yet there it is in the ocean. So yeah. that's a beautiful sh uh, shot. I've never seen a bright red frogfish either. I've seen pretty much every color except bright red, so that's my first time for me. Yeah, yeah. It was 
I'm not sure if it was the very first red one that I've seen, but it's definitely not something that I've seen a lot in my diving career. So that also made it a little more special. Very cool. Yeah. What's shot number three? Shot number three is also from the Maldives. It's uh, a Manta shot that I took on uh, on a dive site that I have personally done a handful of dives on already. And I would go this as far as to say that this has, this to this date, this is the best Manta shot that I have ever taken. Um, and the reason that's the case is because so many things just clicked and lined up on that special occasion for me to be able to get that shot. This is the second uh, attempt of diving on that dive site or the second dive that we did on that dive site on that trip. It is a Manta cleaning station, so it's known to have Mantas on there. On the first dive, we didn't have any Mantas. Um, it's a nice, really pretty coral reef. Uh, I'll play it back right now so you can see it. It's a nice coral reef, hard coral reef, lots of table corals, really, really pretty. And that's where the Mantas come to get cleaned. This was at the very end of the dive. So like we're 60, 65 minutes into the dive. It's, we've just finished our safety stop in five meters of water. We hadn't seen any mantas until then. And then suddenly I see the other divers looking out into the blue and this manta appears. It comes to us, then it turns around and goes out into the blue again. And a lot of people will probably just turn around and go, oh, he's taking off and I'm just gonna finish my dive and go up to the surface. And we didn't do that. We just stuck around and we kept our cameras pointed to the Manta, at the Manta, and we're just waiting patiently, hoping it will come back. And that's what it did. It really came back. It was very relaxed and it came to probably three to four feet away from me and just really did that really, really close pass by. The lighting was just incredible from all the light rays coming in. You can see the details of the eye like I've never seen on like a shot that I have taken before of a Manta. And then when the light hits the back, the black top of the Manta, you can even see some rainbow colors in there. It's just, it's heaven. For me, this, this shot is just absolutely incredible with the colors and the clarity. And it was the perfect day too, because it was calm. There was no waves. It was shallow. There was plenty of sunlight. Um, it was really just so many things that clicked and made this shot possible um, in the first place. And that's kind of the lesson for me here is being patient. And even after having done several dives on this dive site, there's always a way of getting a better shot on the next attempt. And the better you know a dive site, the better you also know how to position yourself in terms of where the sun will be coming from and how you can position and compose your image so that you can get the best possible shot of the situation that unravels in front of you. I mean, that is absolutely jaw dropping. Absolutely stunning. I mean, that is one of the best man shots I've ever seen from anyone ever. Not just yourself, sir. Yeah, I was, I was, Man, I was, I was crying I a little had bit tears, while I was I would have flooded my underwater. mask with tears. Uh, I feel the shot <laughs> is slightly ruined by Addy's ass right there at the end. Um, you know, you could cut that's off the okay, last four seconds and it would be a lot better. Uh, but you know. But that's, what, that's what AI is for, yeah, exactly. you know? But just I'm just joking, Addy, if you're watching this. You, you know, you're a great guy and we love you very much. Um, but also get out of his shot. Um, <laughs> but nice trim though, mate. Nice trim. Uh, mate, that's absolutely heartbreakingly beautiful. That is absolutely, it makes me feel a little bit sick because I don't think I'll ever get to that level. Uh, but it's it's just stunning. It's just, I could just watch that. I would have it as a screensaver. Uh, it's it's absolutely stunning. To get that detail on your right, as he passed by, you can see the eye look straight down the lens of the camera. Like it just kind of gives you the side eye and just oh, oh, straight down the barrel of the lens. Uh, absolutely, yeah, I'd have cried, I'd have exploded, my heart would have exploded. Ah, oh, just what a magical moment. Yeah, so. no, and you wonder who's watching who, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, incredible, absolutely incredible. So yeah, I would even say that's, that's probably my top, my favorite shot of 2023. Right, so, those were my three shots. Now I'm really curious to see your three shots and the stories behind those shots. Indeed. Um, so my first shot comes from Rebreather Forum 4, uh, which was uh, in 
Malta last April that I journeyed to for uh, to get edumacated um, on all the kind of rebreather technology and you know it's just a general conference for rebreather science but I flew in a few days early with a very dear friend of mine Steve Sanford because I'm not going to go to Malta and not dive that doesn't make any sense at all so packed up the rebreather packed up the camera rig and uh and off we went we did uh three dives it seems a lot to take a rebreather and a whole camera rig for literally just three dives but one deep technical dive per day is about my limit um, we did a shakedown dive on a shallow newer wreck which was nothing really to to write home about fine dive but nothing historic or, or special uh, and then we did the hms nasturtium um, which is a world war one era british uh merchant vessel that was militarized during the war and used as uh, cargo and transportation um, sank during World War One, so it's been down a while. She's pretty deep. She's about 65 meters to the sand. Uh, that's 215 feet in American. Uh, and uh, and we had a great dive on it. Um, my dive buddy Steve had a little bit of technical issues, so he was a little bit later coming down the line. But we met up underwater, and it's just a very simple pan shot. If I hit play now, um, you can kind of see I'm tracking. Uh, these other divers, different rebreathers, bottles everywhere, and these little goldfish just coming into my light just add a little splash of color. And then I just pan around so you can see the rest of the wreck. A little bit shaky there. Probably a little bit of narcosis hammering. But yeah, just that structure of the wreck. So it's a very simple shot. It's not technically beautiful, um, but one of the things that this uh, shot means to me is my really what everything scuba diving is about for me it's traveling to cool places it's doing cool dives that maybe not a lot of people get to do uh it's diving with uh somebody who who i met as a student who has become a dear friend and a chosen dive buddy of mine um so our, our friendship and we've got more adventures coming in 2024 me, me and steve it was just a great dive and i still think about that dive very very often and also all the other divers on the boat technical divers from sweden from australia from other parts of the us uh from croatia uh all coming together for this event and getting on these boats together and then we all became friends we all stayed in touch and we're all on each other's facebook and commenting and sharing and this that and the other and that for me is like one of the biggest joys of why i run a diving company i mean that's what i'm in this sport for is is these interactions and these sort of opportunities so a very very simple shot of a very very um simple it was deep but it was a simple technical dive in terms of the conditions and everything was pretty uh pretty rudimentary for us um but i just really love that sort of it brings everything together for me that, that scuba diving is really all about um so that's my first shot what did you think very nice very nice i mean i think we definitely need to consider um that this is a very deep a deep wreck at the, at the the shot was taken very at the very deep uh, depth and having your rebreather with you which is you know for most people that would be technical enough to have a rebreather with them on a dive but that's not enough for you now you just take a big camera rig with you as well what well, because why not right you could do that too right and then take a shot of like a, a freaking deep wreck which is like crazy amazing in the first place the shot what I really like and I, what I think makes the shot really cool is I don't know if they're anteus or another type of fish. Um, the red fish that you can see swimming around in the image and as they come closer and they get illuminated by your light and they really light up and they give that extra punch of color into, into your clip. That's really, really cool. And something that if you think from a perspective where most people think that colorful fish only exist up in the shallows. But this is the proof that that's not true. They do exist in 60, 65 meters down there as well. We just can't really see them if we don't have any lights with us, right? So you're proving us wrong that there is colorful life down there. And I think they make a really nice ad addition to the whole shot, giving an extra dimension of color into that shot. And the seeing a wreck is always quite fascinating. Um, a wreck that has been down there for so long and is still, you know, intact in a certain way. Um, yeah, it's definitely a really cool thing. And I love the story behind it of how these 
these adventures and these memories make friends and friendships that last for a very long time. And I mean, in the end, that's, that's what diving is all about. The, the memories and the adventures that we share with our fellow dive buddies. And uh, that's a perfect example of that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there were people that traveled to Malta uh, just for the conference and didn't dive. And to them, I say, uh, I feel bad for you because it's a great place to go and dive. And, you know, I bought the plane ticket already. Why not throw my gear in the uh, in the back of the plane and, and let's go, you know, that's, that's it. So, absolutely. yeah, thank you, mate, thank you. Um, I've queued up my second clip here. The second clip comes from the Sardine Run uh, in South Africa, which we host uh, every other year um, down there in Port St. John's. Um, this year's Sardine Run compared to 2021 uh, um, was even more epic in terms of like all the stuff you're supposed to see times 100. So the first first year we went, we saw everything you were supposed to see, we checked the list, and there was a bunch of weird oddities. Like we got manta rays, we got mola mola, which you are not supposed to see on the sardine run. Uh, we got orcas, which you're not supposed to see. This one was all the things you're supposed to see. Common dolphin, uh, bottlenose dolphin, bronze whaler sharks, whales, tons and tons of whales, but just, and, and diving birds as well, of course. And that for me, like it was just, it was just turned up to 11. It was just absolutely amplified. Uh, and this shot is the absolute crux of what I mean by that. Um, the story behind this shot is we were on a static bait ball on scuba at about six meters, 18 feet or so. And when you're shooting, you're shooting kind of silhouetted because they want the sun in, uh, behind you. Um, and you're shooting the, the, the bait ball um, so that you're silhouetted for the dolphins and everything and you've got to get out of the way of the predators because if you're blocking the action, uh, that's obviously a bad thing. You're going to kill the bait ball for everyone. So you kind of line up as divers in the water and form like kind of a row with the sun behind you. So that's already fantastic for shooting. And then the predators can come in and, eat, and, and attack this bait ball. And it's a huge tornado of sardines, just a cone of, of sardines pinned against the surface by the dolphins coming in and feeding. And we'd already been on this bait ball for at least 30 minutes, just filming and high-fiving each other, and whooping and hollering, because that is already enough. That is just to get one static bait ball on a week of diving the sardine run is something that you'll think about forever. So all of a sudden, I'm filming these dolphins, I'm filming the, the tornado of sardines. There's a couple of sharks that are waiting their turn because they don't mess with the dolphins. Uh, and I hear somebody squeal through their regulator, just a like that, another diver. So I'm thinking, oh my God, shark attack or something. You know, we're in the middle of a feeding frenzy, okay? So I look over at the diver and they're looking down and I just have my camera rig in my hand. And literally, by the way, only a GoPro. I didn't even take my big rig to Sardine Run this year. Just had a GoPro on a tray with lights. So I hear the squeal, I look at the diver and then I see that they're looking down. So I look to see what they're looking at and this happens. Oh my God. <laughs> so that wasn't me screaming, by the way. There's a few things I really like about that clip. Um, number one is that, that screaming noise. And I leave the clip in because you can hear the, the racket that the dolphins make. One thing I never say is uh, on the sardine run is how loud it is underwater. Because though there's hundreds of dolphins and they're all talking to each other. So imagine being in a room with a hundred people shouting. That's what it sounds like. It's just a cacophony of dolphin sounds. Um, then you've got like a, a diver squealing in their rebreather because they almost get bumped into by a, uh, a young adult female humpback whale that went under the whole group. And then one of the other things I love about that shot is there's one diver down there who wasn't looking at the bait ball. He's probably about 10 feet lower than me. He wasn't part of our group. I don't know who this, this diver was because there are lots of boats out there, I should explain. Uh, and he doesn't see the humpback until the last minute when it's almost past him. So if you see that, let me just play it back again. If you see right at the end here, look at the diver in the bottom right of the shot. So you see that diver right there in the bottom right? He kind of looks up at the last minute and is like, oh my God, a whale. And that's the kind of, again, that surprise and delight tactic that you get with, uh, with the sardine run. That's incredible, mate. That's really incredible. There's so many things I love about this shot. First of all, how many people can say they've 
they've recorded, they filmed a humpback whale underwater. I don't know many. So kudos for doing that. Really, really, really uh, awesome, awesome uh, encounter that you've captured there. I love the screaming. It's just so authentic. Because that's really what happens when you see these creatures underwater. I was lucky enough to have that, um, have made that uh, encounter years years ago on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia while I was teaching an open water class, but that's a different story for another time. Um, but so I do really, I, I love how authentic it is to hear the screaming of that other diver um, underwater. Um, and what I also think is really cool is you mentioned before that on this trip, you only had your GoPro with you, right? Yeah. So I think that's that's where action cams really shine in situations like these, where you don't really have a lot of time to, you know, get your shutter right and do your aperture and then like set the focus and everything. But it's it's like hit or miss. So you gotta press that button and it's just gotta be the shot that it is. And that only really works with cameras that are like have like these presets like. GoPros or action cams. You can do it on larger rigs too, but then you kind of need to have it pre-prepared really um, and just be waiting for it. But if you're doing something else and then you switch around to taking a shot of that whale passing by, chances are it's not gonna be in focus or something. So uh, it's really funny that you decided to go maybe even intuitively with the GoPro for this trip and you ended up with this shot. I really like that about that Yeah, story. it's it, the decision was actually, it wasn't about luggage or weight or anything else. It was about form factor in the water. When you, when you don't have a static bait ball, when the bait ball is moving sideways, you have to swim uh, to keep up with the dolphins. Now, I don't care if you're Michael Phelps, you're not swimming as fast as a dolphin swims, okay? It ain't gonna happen. So you're definitely not gonna swim as fast as the dolphin swims when you've got a big camera rig with lights and lots of drag. And and I just wanted to see, you know, I missed shots on the first sardine run because I had a big camera. And I was like, I'm gonna take a smaller compact and I didn't have arms, I just had lights mounted straight onto the ball, uh, which I didn't hardly use at all anyway. And just a very compact little tray with the GoPro mounted in there. And I only had the tray for stabilities but it was a lot more maneuverable. So when we were in the water and we're swimming hard after the action, it was just a lot more compact. And that, that, that's probably my favorite shot. There were other examples of, uh, you know, a bride's well that went right between my legs. I could have put up there dolphins and birds like coming real close and interacting and all the kind of craziness that happens. Um, but yeah, that was just, like you said, yeah. It, the only reason I got that shot is because I had the GoPro and not the big camera rig. So bigger doesn't always mean better, I guess. That's a very true statement and a good call on taking the GoPro on this trip, I would say. So, that brings me to my third and final shot, which I call yes, uh, Spiny Seahorse and Neighbor. So this is a spiny seahorse that we shot in the Philippines. Uh, this was actually in Dumaguete. Uh, and I had my, my tripod set up, or I was just getting the setup. As you can see, I'm kind of moving the legs around a little bit, which is why it's not perfectly static. And then that happens. So just one of those, uh, you know, filter feeding worms that I didn't even realize was there, uh, literally just opens up behind the seahorse and the actual seahorse's tail is hooked around the, the stalk, the shell of the worm and that's what it's using to anchor it. But I didn't see that worm there. I just saw the seahorse, got down, got my shot, got my snoot on the, on the spiny seahorse, got my focus dialed in on its eye and then I'm looking at the seahorse and making sure that's tack sharp, and I just start to see that worm bloom. Um, so for me, again, not technically perfect, but just the action of surprise, the element of surprise of that worm coming straight up out of the seahorse's tail. I just think the shot is kind of a weird, weird composition. And all the way to the end, the actual worm opens into its full flourish and actually pushes on the seahorse. And the seahorse is like, hey, hey, what's going on? And I just think that's a really, it's funny. It's just funny. I just think it's a very, obviously the worm's not illuminated because I had the snoot on the seahorse. So it could have been a, could have been a more colorful shot, but it's just, I don't know. Every time I think about that shot, I just, it just makes me laugh. I just think it's, uh, there's a comedic element to that. I, I fully understand. It really is a funny shot, especially at the end when the, the tube worm comes out all the way and it starts pushing the seahorse away. And it's like, hey dude, this is my space. Give me some space here. Let me open up. And the seahorse goes like, what's happening here? This wasn't supposed to be here in the first place. Really funny. And 
Nicely lit, by the way, with your snoot. I like how you lit the seahorse and how you how you got it out of, how you got it to stand out from like the surroundings. Very nice bokeh too. Very blurred out in the background. I don't know what you were using, what kind of lens you were using to do that. To yeah, that, that was shot, my micro, but... uh, macro, uh, sorry, micro four thirds macro uh, 30 mil, the, the Panasonic 30 mil. Nice. Nice. Uh, it looks very nice with a very nice blurred out background and then the lighting getting getting it perfect onto the seahorse, isolating that. And that's like a, a very good example of how to do the snooting by isolating the object that you want to film uh, with your snoot and keeping everything else sort of in the dark. So Thank uh, you, man. A, I'm, I'm a snoot nice. amateur. I like it. I'm not, I, you know, I, this is, uh, it, it, there was a lot of learning going on to get that shot. Let's put it that way. Well, you've done a lot of learning from what I can tell you, from what I've seen from you, like within the last couple of months on sort of as a preparation for the Philippines trip and what you've done in, on the Philippines trip. So keep on going that road. That's it. That's it's it, man. For you. That's it. So I thought that was fun. That was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed this yeah. episode. It was great to like look back. Um, looking forward, Absolutely. of course, uh, Matthias and I are co-hosting another trip this year, this time to Indonesia. Uh, we have a week in a resort in Bali to do some fantastic diving. And then we're going to hop down the coast, get on a liverboard and go and explore Komodo, which is going to be also world-class diving. Uh, so camera rigs at the ready for that one. We have a couple of spaces left on both legs of the trip. Most people who are coming on the trip are doing both because if you're going to travel all the way to Indonesia, uh, why not make it a two week uh, jaunt? But um, yeah, I'm right in thinking we have, still have a few spaces left, but not many. Two, we have two spaces left. There you go. Two spaces. That's it, there's two spaces. Who wants them? First come, first served. I will, of course, put a link to the brochure in the description of this video below so you can reach out to me or Matthias and say, hey guys, I want to come to Indo. It sounds amazing. But uh, that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. I know we're going to uh, capture tons of great footage there. And maybe January 2025, we'll do a repeat of this video with the best shots from 2024. I think that would be a fun thing. I would really like that. This was fun. I like that. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for watching. I've got to go to the uh, airport right now, so I'm out of here. Um, but as always, thank you for joining us. Matthias, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and for sharing that beautiful footage with us. Thank you too. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.